It is an honor to be here. I've never been anywhere where there's much focus on prayer with speakers before we speak. And folks, that's where all the power is. We know that. Now, let me do one thing that I always get asked with my last name, Frizzell. Some of you folks over 50 are wondering, am I any kin to the famous old country music singer, Lefty Frizzell? Very distantly, I see a hand. <laughs> Very distantly, I am. But you can relax. I will not try to sing country music to you. You'd need a prayer conference for your ears if I did, if you know what I mean. And you're hearing an official Tenahoma accent. I go out, out west and up north, and they ask me, what kind of accent is that? A pastor in Tennessee, 20 years, Oklahoma, 12 now. So I don't know what that accent is, but no matter what our accents are, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And he's got a family around the world that is beginning to explode in power. India, China, parts of Africa. But you and I both know we need a touch of God like we have not seen in our lifetime. Let me go ahead and ask you, how many of you in here can clearly remember 1905? Let me see your hand. I got a hand back there, and he's really well preserved, too, I'll tell you. <laughs> well, the reason I ask you that, you probably know that's the last time there's been anything in America even close to a great spiritual awake. In other words, we don't remember a mighty explosion of God. In fact, we've got some serious signs. Though the population's doubled, you know baptisms are down and ratios have collapsed, morals have collapsed. You didn't come to hear all that, but it is devastating. We've never been here before, but the prayer movement in America, which is 40 years long now, and that's never happened either, a prayer movement that long and no awakening, but the prayer movement is beginning to deepen. And there are signs in a small remnant that God is bringing us back, or at least potentially bringing us back, to the missing element that explodes baptisms and missions, and God gets all the glory. We can't take any credit. We're going to be talking about how God truly brings us back to the type of prayer that brings New Testament power. I'm going to ask you to take your Bible and turn to Acts chapter 1 and verse 4. Acts 1, 4. We're also going to look briefly in James 5, 16. I love this conference already. The focus on joy, the focus on grace, the focus on God, because he's still on the throne, folks. He hadn't lost his power. I want to give you a quick testimony to kind of set the stage for what we're going to talk about. You know better than to pray for patience, don't you? You know how you get it. Well, you ought to pray for it. It's through the Spirit. But another prayer kind of like that is to pray for experience. Please don't pray that prayer. Right before I graduated from seminary in 1983, I prayed, oh, God, give me experience. He said, okay. And so I was going to a church in Memphis, first church out of seminary, going as associate pastor, minister of evangelism. Right before I went, I turned on the 6 o'clock news, and they were leading a woman out of that church in handcuffs. Child sexual abuse in the church daycare. You hadn't even heard of that in 1984. Uh, it's all the media would talk about. Front page of the paper, the church was in a gang area, and I was a little bit nervous about that. I'm from a small town in West Tennessee. And um, now this, now I'm terrified. That's all they talk about. And they finally called me. And they said, we're devastated. We cannot call a staff person with all this going on. Folks, I went, Whew, I'm glad you can. I didn't want to go. But it kept getting worse. And they called me back and they said, would you still pray about coming to be on this church staff? I said, oh, yes, I'll pray about it. I thought, there ain't no way I'm going in that mess. And I prayed about it. And God said, you're going. I hadn't been there six weeks. It blew up like an atomic bomb. They arrested the pastor that was there. And now it wasn't just child abuse. It was devil worship in the church baptistry, supposedly. Now, that's on TV every single day, front page of the paper. Then they arrested two more people. And they forgot to tell me, but the church was divided right down the middle before the legal battle even started. I'm telling you, folks, this thing was, was something else. Then the legal bill started exploding, got up to around $2 million dollars before you could bat your eyes, and it was a fairly small church with a big building debt. Hey, by the way, don't you feel really good about your church right now? <laughs> well, I can laugh now. I wasn't no, any laughing then, but folks, the reason I'm telling you the story, for five solid years, that church was on the 6 o'clock news, and six, about six months into it, I became their pastor. Had no experience, had no idea what to do, still don't. But through what we're about to talk about from the Word of God, God took that hopeless mess, and I'm not exaggerating, for five years. It was on the 6 o'clock news, three or four nights a week, and you know how they are. They told all those stories all over again. Folks, it was hopeless. 
Yet God so moved, saved the church, exploded baptism. Now the ministry, our ministry from that has gone to 40 languages. It's nothing I did. It's getting back to New Testament power that is a missing element in many things we're doing today. And folks, if he could do something there with people who sure were average people, there is hope for your church. Father, thank you that all the power is yours, all the wisdom is yours, all the righteousness is yours. Father, how I pray that you will bring encouragement to us. You will show us what to do to let you take us back to the New Testament secret. Lord, back to the secret of all the great awakenings of history. But Father, tonight, above all, help us know what to do to let you fill us with a new joy, with a new power, with your instructions that you will anoint and get all the glory. And oh, Father, tonight, increase our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It is very possible to get beat down and discouraged today. But as we read Acts 1-4, and we think about what God did with that group of people who had problems we can't even imagine. They were facing so much more than we faced. But beginning in this passage, Acts 1-4, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. Now, folks, that word wait did not mean go have a committee meeting. <laughs> it didn't mean go have a strategy session. It meant go pray, pray together, and pray fervently, and pray in faith for something. He told them about the Spirit that was going to come upon them. And they did that for 10 days. There's a pattern there. Intense, powerful, God-focused prayer is where the secret is of New Testament power. It was their main secret, along with preaching. Verse 8, he says, you shall receive power. And that's the word we get dynamite from. He's saying, you're going to become spiritual dynamite. It's, it's happening in, in India right now in the middle of persecution. It's unbelievable what God's doing. Same thing in China, parts of Africa, parts of South America. But in America, there's, there's been some dampening. Praise God, there are pockets of power. But he said they were going to receive power, and it was through the prayer. Well, we remember Acts chapter 2, day of Pentecost, and God came on them. And the first thing they, they noticed about them, I love what our, the former speaker said, they were so full of joy they got accused of being drunk. <laughs> they were also bold. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And we can't work that up. We can't produce that on our own because we've all got wounds and problems. By the way, he mentioned 40 books. Number one, I'm not a writer. And I had an illness in 94 that devastated my neurological system. They said, you won't be speaking or writing anymore. And I didn't get healed. You said, well, you're speaking. Only one reason. It's because of what we're about to talk about. God can turn the power on when we have none. He can give us joy when we, we live with pain. It's all His grace when we learn how in the New Testament way to let it flow. Well, that's what they had. I love Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. He might have flunked some preaching classes today or some theories. Uh, it wasn't very attractive, but the power of God was so on him that 3,000 people got baptized on the spot. And folks, when they did that, they're putting their head on the chopping block. He wasn't saying, you want to be happy, don't you say a little prayer? He was saying, repent. And they did. Power of God. <laughs> The early church turned the world upside down. Even their enemies had to say, here comes those people that are turning the world upside down. They didn't have any strategies much. They didn't have any programs much. Now, those are great things. They weren't all that educated. That's a good thing as far as education. But they didn't have a lot of that. But they had this incredible power. We've got to ask, where did it come from? And it's right here. Folks, it is impossible to do Acts 1-8 ministry and power without Acts 1-4 praying. And in America, nobody meant to, but over the last 50, 60 years in the instant mindset, many of us have gotten inoculated. You know what inoculation is? You get a weakened version of something that keeps you from getting the real thing. That can happen with prayer. We can get an Americanized version of a quiet time, an Americanized version of surrender, and it isn't bad. It's kind of devotional, and God's so good, He blesses us some, but it's like being in first gear. You could drive from here to Los Angeles in first gear be a long drive. We can live the Christian life kind of in devotional prayer, not bad, seeing some blessings and praise God for every one of them. But folks, if God turns the power on, our baptisms will go up not three or four, or even 30 or 40, but like three to 400 percent, and they would be conversions, not decisions. There is an enormous problem today with a lot of people that say a prayer, nothing happens. There's no conviction, no repentance, 
And you know the statistics that only about 20, 30 percent of our churches are growing, and many of those, it's very little conversion growth in many cases. Certainly, the early church had no transfer growth. Transfer growth is great. That's a good thing. It usually says something very good about the church that's growing. But today we're seeing an absence of that mighty, powerful conviction, and their secret was prayer. Well, if you will turn to James 5.16, this is so exciting to me because it isn't out of reach. New Testament powerful prayer is not legalism. It's not condemnation. It's not you got to pray three hours. It's you get to be closer to Jesus. And he fills us with a new power. But James 5.16 is really the key. It talks about a certain type of prayer. I'm sure you know this. There's different types of prayer. Uh, there's the more devotional, which is very good, but it's usually pretty short. And, but there's the, the God-seeking, revival-producing, stronghold-tearing-down prayer that moves mountains and explodes baptisms. And it's all in God's time. We don't measure ourselves strictly by numbers. But James 5.16 is a very important principle. Confess your trespasses one to another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. You understand that is a very important so that. What that really means is if the deep cleansing and yielding of our heart does not get all the way to the bottom and get really thorough with real brokenness and humility, neither does the healing come. Now he was talking here about physical healing, but he broadens it in the next verses to praying for any kind of a flood. Elijah praying for the flood. So this is far beyond physical healing. But notice the next part of that verse. It says, it is the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man, that'd be a woman too, <laughs> that avails much. Have you really chewed on that verse? If some prayer is effective, it means a lot of other prayer is what? Prayer can be very ineffective. I wish it couldn't be, but it is. The Pharisees prayed their heads off all day. They fasted all the time. You didn't hear a word they said. And folks, in history, 2,000 years of the church, there's never been a 40-year prayer movement as loud as the one we have today and a total collapse at the same time. That's never happened. Usually 12, 15 years, they had a great awakening. What's going on? Well, in some ways, the prayer movement in America has been a mile wide but a half inch deep. It's been a lot more about give me, give me, bless me, bless me, then cleanse me, change me, break me, and reach my lost neighbor. But it's changing, folks. It's deepening. And I believe with all my heart, I know it's happening. There's a little remnant. And by the way, revivals come from a little remnant. Don't worry about the sleeping majority. Pastor, don't let that bother you in your church. He's going to send this mighty movement through a tiny little remnant that goes deeper in their prayer. That's what's beginning to happen. But he says it's the effective, fervent. That means anointed, impassioned. Maybe some tears, God-empowered, fervent prayer of a righteous man. That means an utterly yielded heart that God has searched all the way to the bottom. Down to our secret thoughts, our, our secret motives, God wants it all, but not in condemnation. He doesn't say, let us search our heart and try our thoughts to condemn us or beat us up, but to fill us up. But the point is, many precious people in America got the Martha syndrome. Now, you know what the Martha syndrome is, don't you? I know I've had it several times. I really believe Martha had to have been one of the first Southern Baptists. I just believe she was. <laughs> uh, you know that great story in the Bible, two sisters. Jesus was in their home and teaching in one part of the house, and uh, everybody listening to him, Mary sitting at his feet. And Martha, she's spiritual. You know, she's noble. She's going to sacrifice and let them enjoy being with Jesus. And evidently in the kitchen, it doesn't say that, but it implies it. And she was working her head off, but after a while, old Martha just gets in the flesh. You say, how do you know? Well, think about what she did, folks. She went in that room where Jesus was, and she didn't whisper this in his ear. It made the Bible, everybody heard her. She must have said it pretty loud. And it doesn't tell us if she had her hand on her hip or not, but it sounds like she might have because we do know exactly what she said to the Son of God where everybody could hear it. She said, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all this work by myself? Tell her to get in here and help me. <laughs> Folks, I don't know if she said it like that, and she probably didn't. She probably didn't have her hand on her hip, but that is exactly what she said. I would imagine they said, what's he going to say to that? <laughs> and he said, Martha, Martha. I don't know how he said it, but what he said was very important. He said, Mary has chosen the greater part, and it shall not be taken from her. St all the studies show 
that we are the most strategized, programmed, educated, innovated <laughs> generation by far that's ever existed in history, and praise God for that. It's a lot of that stuff God's using. And I'm excited because He's laying a foundation that in prayer can get right in the center of it, there can really be an explosion. But in America, many studies show many believers' quiet times have gotten very quiet and have gotten very short. And the thing that's missing is the deep cleansing of heart. Folks, God is still holy. We're under grace. That doesn't mean sin's no big deal anymore. And today in America, it is so easy to get contaminated and not even mean to. Most of the stuff you look at on TV, it's going to grieve the Spirit if we look at it. It's changed that much, but many believers have been tricked into kind of sliding along. We're, we're, we're an epidemic of, of unforgiveness. Many people are in this church simply because they get mad at this one, but they've never really let it go. And so we've gotten very good at just moving on or saying we've forgiven someone, but down in our heart, there's still a speech we'd like to say to someone. Now, here's the good news. God loves us right in the middle of that. But what we're talking about is letting God take us to the New Testament kind of prayer. You look at Paul, you look at Peter, you look at Jesus, and he is the example. He is the pattern. They spent much time in prayer. It wasn't a little brief moment on the run. And certainly Paul and Peter, Jesus didn't need the cleansing, but Paul and Peter understood the holiness of God. When you look back at all the great awakenings of history, there was a common denominator. It wasn't even their denomination. God used different denominations. It certainly wasn't their preaching style. But there was one common denominator. The people God is really using a generation that exploded with power. They moved back to a type of prayer that was all about surrender everything. God says we have not not just turned from sin, but turned from the weights. That may be a, a ball game. That may be something that's just, I like too much. But folks, the good news, it's all grace. But we have to embrace it as a love relationship, and He explodes in power. Let me give you an illustration of what I'm talking about. That t church I told you about <laughs> that I went right out of the seminary, been there five years. We did everything we could do. I mean, every strategy, every program, and God blessed them a little, but we were dying. Can you imagine? Who's going to visit that church with all that stuff on TV every day? Nobody did. And I was so beat up at the end of five years. And, you know, you can preach. You can go on and do your job. But inside, you're just beat up. You're burned up. And um, we've all been there one time or another. And I was moaning and groaning, Lord, we've done all we could do. We've tried to witness. We've done all the things. And, and the Lord said, there's one thing you had not do. You don't have an effective, fervent, absolutely yielded prayer life. I thought, now, Lord, my prayer life's pretty good by American standards. You know how you'll think. You don't realize you're talking to God. But um, it was really God. And I was saying, Lord, I've been through that cleansing list. Lord, I've been through that cleansing guide. And you know what the Lord said to me? As clear as ever said anything in my life. He said, you've been through the American guide. He said, there's another one. <laughs> And I, he had me look at some of the great awakenings and some of those two or three hundred scriptures that those dear people would pray through. I mean, he went down to your secret thoughts and down to your motives, down to everything, but not to beat you up, but to set you free. You could do it legalistically, but the Lord said, add this to you quite a bit. Not every day, of course, just two or three a day, but over a period of a few weeks, as you add that yielding, trusting him to show you, he begins to show you things. People you said you'd forgiven down deep, you really hadn't. It hides on us. The person that you said, oh, I don't really need to go to them. I, they're, they're, they're not really mad, or they shouldn't be. But God says, yes, they are. And you, and you start getting honest. And he shows you pride where you're more concerned about your comfort than the glory of God. And the Lord just started doing a work. And, folks, the most amazing thing happened. This, this new joy came over me. And things were just awful in the church. I mean, it was just horrible. And I started getting so full of joy. They, they got worried about me. They said, do you need to take a vacation? They thought I was having a nervous breakdown. I said, there's nothing wrong with me, I promise you. And, and the Lord, what the Lord was saying to me was that I really needed to take my people to that level of prayer. And I needed to, to tell them a little quiet time on the run is really not enough. It's not bad. But God's called us to more than that. There has to be surrender in our walk with Him. Maybe not every day, but pretty often has to be deep. Search my heart means search. And I had never done that. I taught them a little, you know, five-minute thing, and I taught them the little, some of the little models today that don't have any real yielding in it. And, folks, that's where the power comes from. Well, the Lord led me to try to teach them, and you know how it is. Only about 5 or 10% were really interested. But that 5 or 10% changed their quiet time. And instead of five or ten minutes, it was 30, 40, and it turned into an hour. They didn't want it to, but it did. God kind of took over. And he was doing this deep cleansing work in many of them. And the thing about the early church, they were full of faith, full of joy, full of power. Again, it wasn't their style, but it was power. And I began to see that happen. Um, there was one precious woman that had a son named Darren. He was 19. He was in a nosedive. He was about to wreck his life. 
and I don't have to tell you this, we're in an absolute epidemic of children raised in church who are getting ripped away from God as soon as they get 18. Folks, 30 years ago, it was about 58%. Now, it's between 70 and 80. We're talking about kids raised in church. Leaders, it's an epidemic. The, the warfare has intensified. The devil's firing real bullets. And praise God for apologetics that are getting stronger today. When they get tired with some of what we're about to talk about, just don't tell them what God's going to do. But Miss Addie was one of those. And she'd prayed her head off for her son for three years, and he just kept getting worse. And the tragedy is we're seeing a lot of precious people praying for their children, and, and they're really not changing much. That's the disturbing thing. In many ways, some of the prayer has often got stuck in more that devotional, but not the warfare level. Folks, we've got to go to the warfare level today. We've got so many pe- precious pastors that have prayed for revival for 10 years and done everything they can do, and their hearts are good. They're, they're working their heads off, and half of them are just really beat up. But we're seeing a group of pastors go to that next level of New Testament prayer with utter surrender, and their faith is getting stronger. They're getting words. They're getting instructions on what to do, and it works when God gives it to them. But back to Addie. She changed her quiet time, and she did three things. She said, God, I'm going to quit rushing you. And I'm going to let you search every area of my whole life with those two or 300 scriptures. And again, you don't do that every day. <laughs> and God will guide you periods of time to do that. It's a love relationship, not legalism. But she did that. And God showed her about 10 or 12 things in her life. Again, people she hadn't forgiven said she had, but she hadn't. And she began to, God got a lot more real to her. Folks, the most beautiful thing is to see folks get their joy back and get their freshness back. Folks, with God, it's all about the heart. It's all about a heart on fire. And we can't work that up. It's all about, he hates, first, hates us when we lose our first love. And you know what? We can't help do it without, without his grace. But I saw her get her first love back. And here's what she did. God, I'm going to give you a little more time, let you search my heart. And God, increase my faith and help me pray in power for my son. Seeing that in pastors. God, take me to another level of prayer that I can really, like oh, Elijah, I didn't read it, but he had that word from God. And he put his face on the ground all those times and kept praying, kept believing. That's a, that's a picture. You may have to do that 70 times, but if we stay with it in God's time, the flood comes. It, it, you, the next guy may get to see it. You may not even get to see it, but folks, the flood will come when we go deeper in prayer eventually in God's time. Back to Addie. She was now praying for Darren with a whole new power. She was praying with greater faith. And some prayers take years. I'm, it's not magic, but the effective, fervent prayer of an absolutely yielded heart in real faith is much more powerful than just a little devotional prayer on the run. And I'll tell you what happened. This was one of those great answers that came quick. Um, it was the funniest thing, though. She'd, for three years, she would stand up and pray for Darren and cry in the prayer meeting because he was getting worse. But about the seventh or eighth week of her new walk with God, her new prayer life, that woman's face changed in the prayer meeting. She stood up smiling ear to ear. And she said, y'all keep praying for Darren, but God is going to touch my son. And, folks, he was worse than ever. And I, I went to her gently, and I said, Addie, have you seen Darren? I thought she hadn't seen him. She said, oh, yeah, I've seen him. I said, why are you so happy? Listen to what she said. She said, Greg, seven, eight weeks ago, I was praying my head off, but there were things in my heart that were really hindering the power of God. The unconfessed sin does hinder prayer. And she said, I'm sure not perfect, and none of us ever get perfect. But she said, I'm yielded. And she said, I just sense his power so much greater than I've ever known. And she said, two weeks ago, God gave me two promises for my son. I don't know how or when, but God said my son's going to be saved, and he's going to be a minister. I said, oh, that's, that's nice. He wasn't no minister. But, but do you see what's happened? This is very important. That woman has gone from not bad, average prayer, devotional, to believing prayer with a clean heart in the power of the Spirit, fervently, there's much greater power there. There just is. Uh, Every revival in history came from that type of prayer. Nothing less. But see, many precious believers have gotten tricked into settling for less than that. We're working our heads off. But that's where the the New Testament power comes from. Well, this was a nice quick answer. I was church studying about a month later, 10 o'clock at night, the buzz rang. You didn't go to the door where our church was. I got where I could see, and it was Darren. He was pacing. He looked nervous. Hair was all messed up. And I said, oh, man, he's on drugs. I dreaded it. And I went to the door, and I said, Darren, what is it? He almost ran over me. And um, I thought, yeah, he's on drugs. He's strung out. He went down to my office. He's pacing like a wild animal. And he kept saying, I can't stand this. I said, what's the matter with you? And he said, I don't know what's the matter with me. We went back and forth. And finally, I took him by the shoulder and said, Darren, just tell me what's happening with you. He looked at me with a puzzled look. And he said, I don't know what's wrong with me. But for the last seven or eight weeks, all I can think about is giving my whole life to Jesus Christ. 
That man was under conviction. I mean the real thing, not the American version. He was, and the strongholds in his life were being torn down by a woman who was now doing warfare prayer. Folks, we're past God bless them prayer. We just are. He'll do some with that. <laughs> well, Darren didn't need me. He just knelt on the floor and gave his heart to Jesus Christ. When he, when he got up, I was looking, a new creature. His eyes were different. His face was different. And folks, he, Sunday morning, he ran down the church aisle and joined the church. church couldn't believe it. Attic couldn't believe it. And he, God gave him this beautiful singing voice you've ever heard in your life. This was like 19 years ago. He's now one of the strongest deacons in Nashville, Tennessee. He's been mission trips all over the world. His own experience. Guess what's happened just recently? He's ordained as a minister. <laughs> God has not lost his power. Go to Africa. Go to India. Man, he's moving. He's moving here too. Some of your lives, he's moving. But the New Testament power only comes from New Testament prayer, and God's still holy. They're singing holy, holy, holy around the throne. Folks, it's, but here's the good news. It's not out of reach. I'm not telling you you've got to pray three hours a day. I'm not telling you well, that God's going to look at you and say, I would have blessed you, but you're five minutes short. <laughs> Or I would have heard you, but you didn't say it right, or you left off one of those cleansing scriptures. I'm not saying that to you. But, folks, we really do have to get beyond most of what's going on. 2,000 years of church history, there's never been an awakening that did not come from this type of prayer, and there will not be one today. I want to give you one of the illustration. Because we can do it. We have a little books, and we don't make a dime on these books, and they're three or four bucks or $15 books for that. And if you don't have three or four bucks, take it free, and I mean that. I'm not pushing the book. But I'm telling you, it's got those scriptures in it that are missing. It's got the level of cleansing that's about grace, but it's deep. And so that's, that's the uniqueness of the book. I'm, I'm telling you that. I, want you, I don't want you to leave with the one. I'm not sure how to do that. <laughs> Worst thing that happens, you don't know how to do it, do it. There's two books. The one's got all those 200 scriptures. The other one just got how to take your quiet time to the level of really listening to God, getting your heart clean, and letting his, his joy fill you and his power fill you. But the illustration that happened after that, of course, the church was still in that horrible mess. And... Um, Nobody ever visited, we, except the FBI. <laughs> they visited quite a bit. And the, new, the news media was, I'm, I'm not kidding, the news media there better for Sunday. And, uh, but the people that changed their quiet time started praying together. And, you know, I think Jesus said something about that. Let's see, my house shall be called a house of committees, amen. <laughs> Activities, and those are all great. But he said prayer, and folks, he, he didn't mean what we say a prayer at Sunday school. He was talking about the corporate prayer of the temple where they prayed together. And, folks, the early church got that because when the day of Pentecost came, they didn't say, okay, now we can do strategies and programs. We got the Spirit. They kept praying. They kept up those powerful prayers. They didn't pray 10 days necessarily. But, folks, you know, I'd miss that. And God said, if you'll get these people to pray together. And we'd had prayer groups for five years, but it was mostly, mostly eating, to be honest with you, <laughs> and, and mostly about health problems, and that's good, but, uh, but it wasn't about souls, and it wasn't about the outpouring of the Spirit of God, and it didn't have any cleansing in it. Folks, we never outgrow that. Paul didn't, and we sure not going to. He said, I hadn't arrived. I'm pressing toward the mark. He said, we're continually perfecting wholeness in the fear of God, all by His grace, but we have to choose it, okay? I'd never led my people to do that, and they're sure not going to if we don't lead them. And so I took those people that would. We invited everybody. We told, we told them, we, went, we may be up here two hours, and we're going to let God search our heart. We're going to pray for a bunch of lost people, and we're not going to eat anything. That thinned the crowd. <laughs> but that's exactly what God wanted. You see, it doesn't take a big crowd. Those, but about 15 of those people got together. It's about between two and 300 in the church. It, it wasn't a big church. They began to pray for, for the outpouring of God. Of course, we hadn't hardly seen anybody getting saved in five years until they changed our quiet times. Then Miss Addie started seeing those sons and some of those husbands come to Jesus. It was incredible. But I, I'm fully convinced God has a sense of humor. Because with all that stuff on TV, and I mean, I hadn't told you everything. It was worse than what I've told you. It was unbelievable. But we even got so desperate before God showed us to change our prayer life that we went, to, I got this bright idea, if we tell enough people about Jesus, somebody's got to get saved, and it's a pretty good idea, really, but uh, what was left of that church, I said, let's, let's, let's witness to 10,000 people in six weeks, and it was a lot of senior adults, and it was August in Memphis, and, and they said, we'll do it, we'll try anything, and folks, they went, went to 5,000 households, two and a half, to, they visited 10,000 people in six weeks, and not one person visited our church, <laughs> not one, that's when I said, okay, we're done, I'm through, that's when he said, no, Develop New Testament prayer, and I'll give you New Testament power. And then he said, now, you've got to help your people take their quiet time deeper, none of this Americanized stuff. 
And now you've got to get them to pray together just like the early church did and like they did in every great awakening. We're not going to come up with a different idea. <laughs> with all of our strategies, if we don't have this, we'll never have New Testament power, at least not in a big scale. I'll tell you what happened. As they were praying for those 60 lost people, um, we started seeing conviction settle down on those people. But the funny thing, they, they got a word from God because we were dying for tithers and teachers. We were just dying for leaders. And they got this promise in prayer, pray the Lord the harvest that he'll send forth laborers into the harvest. I thought, you mean we went to 10,000 people, now you want us just to ask you to send people? And that's what he was saying. Now, we had to always go out. That doesn't mean we don't do the strategies and going out. That's, but I'll tell you what happened. Those, they started praying. I could tell they were praying with new power. I could tell they were praying in faith. And you could just sense the power of God in that prayer meeting. And here's a sense of humor. Uh, they did that for about six weeks, and no, nobody came. I went out one Sunday morning, like I done for five years, and there was about 30 new faces sitting out there. You notice that in a group of 200. It actually scared me. I, I asked a deacon, I said, what's going on with the case? Well, these news media doing here. <laughs> he said, they're not news media. We don't know who they are. That made me nervous, you know. And I preached like I done for five years, and nobody ever maybe pray a little, nobody ever joined. And folks, seven people jumped out on the aisle and walked straight up to me. I was out of practice. I almost said, what do you want, you know? <laughs> I didn't say it, but I thought, I really thought. I thought, what are you doing? What do you want? <laughs> they said, we want to join this church. I almost said, don't you have a TV? <laughs> I did say, why do you feel led to join this church? I was so happy I was almost skipping. And they said, we don't know. They looked at a puzzle look. They said, God told us to visit this church in all this trouble. Now he's telling us to join this church. And folks, when Baptists joined on the first Sunday, that's a miracle. You know? <laughs> and, and the next Sunday, here come four or five. It was just, it wasn't some big church split. They weren't all coming from the same. It was a miracle. He still does them. New Testament prayer brings New Testament miracles, but it's the only thing that really will in a big scale. We'll see mercy drops without it. Well, then those 60 lost people, within about four months, 45 of the 60 got gloriously born again. And what I noticed was they were born again. I have to beg one of them to get baptized. They'd knock you down and get the baptistry. Folks, we're, we're so blessed. We've, we're more educated than we've ever been. We've got tremendous innovative methods, ways to connect with culture, and that's all really important. And apologetics is getting stronger. But you, you and I know, if we honestly look at the numbers, we're about to hit an age bomb. It's going to be devastating unless there's a great awakening. But praise God, he can still do it. He hadn't lost his power and he hadn't lost his grace. But he can't do much at a distance. And he can't do much if we got the Martha syndrome. Has that happened to you? It's happened to me more than once. But thank God we don't have to live there. I'm going to ask that we bow our heads and hearts before God in prayer. Where are you tonight, really? I mean, we can sing. We can, you can hear sermons. But where are you in your heart? It, it, has there been a waning of, of that first love, that, that joy, that freshness? And you're, you're just not seeing much power. And, and you know you've prayed. You know you've worked. You know you've labored. But maybe tonight God's showing you there's, there can be a deepening in personal prayer with surrender, with deeper surrender. It's all grace. We don't earn it, but we have to show up. We have to shut the door and go in our closet, and we have to embrace the deep searching of our heart. Friends, we're either doing that or we're not. That's either pretty much our pattern. It will all look a little different in doing that. But if tonight it's just dawned on, you know, Craig, I think I have kind of gotten the Martha thing. I think I have stopped short of New Testament prayer and fasting, and they fasted a lot. Is that a pattern in your life? Is the deep surrender a pattern in your life? Surely we don't think we've outgrown it, but the devil tricks us like that, and we just somehow drift away from it. So tonight, whether it's your, your daring that you're so burdened about, or whether it's your church, whether it's your your wife, your husband, whether it's your own heart, something's got a grip on you. Anger, fear, bitterness, unclean thoughts. And though we all can look nice here, with many of us there's some bondage. Would you be willing right now to say, God, take me deeper? Lord, help me show up like Addie did. Lord, help me give you a little more time. Would you right now just ask God to help you do that? As a love relationship, not not duty, but earning, but, but loving Him. Would you be willing right now to say, Lord, take me to a level of cleansing that I've never been, a level of surrender that I've never known. 
Lord, take me to brokenness that comes from you, not something I can fake. He'll take you there. It's all grace, but you've got to embrace it. You've got to show up, embrace the Scriptures. Maybe tonight you, it's dawned on you. I'm praying, but not with a lot of faith. I hope God does something in my church, but I don't have a word from God. I hope God touches my loved ones or lost people, but I'm not praying like, like Addie with that faith, with that power right now. Would you ask God to increase your faith? He will. The, one of the smartest things the disciples ever prayed, Luke 17, 5, Lord, increase our faith, and he did. I want you to know there's hope. God saved that hopeless church in Memphis. Nothing I did. It was the people getting back to prayer, and it wasn't even the majority. If Great Awakening doesn't come to America, and it may not, we're under judgment in a lot of ways. Folks, it could get a lot worse real fast. But even if it does, Jesus is still on the throne. And his remnant can still be revived and empowered to lead a lot of people to Jesus. But only by those three things, significant time, deep cleansing, and asking God to increase our faith and effectiveness in prayer. And I promise you something, because I'm not promising he is. He said, if you draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. If you seek me with all your heart, you'll find me. Just like the early church, just like all the great awakenings, may God help us never again to settle for just being a Martha. Martha's are great, but let's be a Martha that prays like Mary. And God can touch your life, your church. You can have your joy back. Father, what are these words? Help each of us as a love relationship to change, to make adjustments, to show up, to embrace your cleansing so your power can flow. Encourage these precious people. Everything we do in evangelism, oh God, help it be saturated in this kind of prayer, and we know we'll see your kind of power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's a dear brother that is back there. If you want to pray with him, um, he's volunteered to do this. Some of us just need a breakthrough. God can give them. Thank you.